All right. Hi there, guys. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks for having me here. I'm uh, yeah. I'm super happy that I can join you. Uh, then join you virtually. I would have loved to join you in real life, but I'm also happy that uh, that I can be here uh, during the during the conference online. And uh, so far, I think it's been working out great. So super happy that uh, that we can do it like this. And perhaps we can do um, we can do it live next year in uh, in Poland. And uh, I'd really like to join you guys uh, then. Um, Today, I would like to talk to you about building an open core SaaS business. I'm going to take you through some of the things that we've been doing as Open Social, give you a bit of background there, um, but really talk about like, hey, what's open core? How, how does it match with SaaS? Uh, how does this match with open source even? Uh, it's pretty con controversial as well. So let's go through some of these points and uh, we'll probably discuss a lot of them um, uh, a lot, lot of different things during the presentation. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll probably not go in depth to all of the things. So if you have any questions, just throw them in the chat and I'll be more than happy to uh, to, to, to answer some questions at the end or uh, talk to you later during maybe the meetup session, the networking tab or, uh, or in a different uh, session altogether. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm a CTO at Open Social now for a little bit over a year now. We've changed the company organization uh, last uh, last year during the summer a bit. Um, I'm a Drupal user for well over a little bit over nine years now. So I've started using Drupal um, when I was still a student, and I've been uh, been uh, practicing uh, with Drupal six, Drupal five a little bit uh, even, Drupal six, Drupal seven, and Drupal eight uh, obviously more recently, and Drupal nine even more recently. Um, yeah, you can reach me via Twitter uh, down below or on Drupal.org or get open social or anything really with bumped and over. I think uh, I don't have any special nickname, so you can find me all over the web with uh, with that name. And again, like I'd like to talk to you about the open core uh, SaaS and some of the lessons we we've learned uh, with open social. So what's open social? It's a distribution for um, uh, for open community software. Uh, you can download it for free on uh, on Drupal.org. We think we have about 1,500 users now, or at least that is pinging back to Drupal.org. And we have uh, quite quite a few downloads as well. Pretty happy with that result. Um, yeah, it's community software. It can be used by NGOs, governments, uh, for participating with their, um, uh, with, their, with their municipality, for example, with their citizens as a city, uh, business to business, business to consumer, social internet, others that I can't really think of right now. Uh, and it's mainly to bring together a community of people, or at least bring together a couple of uh, people uh, to talk about a certain topic, or as an internet, you want to work together with your colleagues. Um, it consists of different kinds of features, members, groups, events. You can sign up to events. You can um, uh, uh, private message with each other. You can discussions, uh, photo upload. It's it's a little bit like Facebook, maybe sometimes uh, uh, if we if you uh, compare it to that. Um, and more importantly, I think the core is open source, so it's uh, free on Drupal.org. It's uh, like your normal uh, Drupal distribution. And on top of that, uh, we as a company, as Open Social, we have a couple of extensions we built around this the open source variant uh, with extensions and, and paid model. Uh, hosting and uh, different kind of services. Um, yeah, and uh, I think most of you know Open Social as a distribution. So, yeah, if you want more info on us, then you can visit our site as well. So get opensocial.com. Um, little, a little brief, brief history. Um, let me. Cool. Right. Uh, brief history from from an agency pr to product. And uh, to understand a little bit where open social came from and why we're doing what we're doing and why we're talking now about open core and SaaS, uh, uh, the SaaS business, take a, let's take a brief look into the history. Um, I see also that Drupal Norway uses open social. Super awesome. Really nice to hear that. Thanks, uh, thanks guys. Um, uh, open social started as a project from, uh, from, from what is really our typical Drupal full service agency. We are located in Enschede, which is in the east of the Netherlands. And we worked on 
well, I would say all kinds of projects, small ones, big ones for NGOs, again, uh, for, for business to business, government. We worked for, um, well, for, for pretty much anything. We later also expanded with an office in Amsterdam where we were able to well, take on some, some, some bigger projects and uh, uh, get some connections there. We're part of also of the startup Delta in the Netherlands, which is uh, well about uh, well, matching startups with each other and getting collaboration done there. And as a well, full service agency, we did strategy, design, development, marketing, all the usual things. And our business model was like, well, any agency really, centered around billable hours, maximizing the output or the revenue you get for the hours that, uh, that you have available. Uh, more recently, we were able to get a 1.25 million investment from two, two top VCs in the Netherlands, which we'll be using to well, further promote uh, open social uh, for our commercial part, obviously, but also really invest in uh, in the core product, which is open source on, on Drupal.org. So we really want to bring also some of this money back into uh, into into the, the community. Um, so yeah, that, that costs us a lot of, well, I think several years of work, five years probably, before we actually got to this point. So we've been doing this for a couple of years. And our path to get there wasn't very easy. So we, we really had to change our company in uh, several aspects. Um, a lot is about that is about mindset, about habits, culture, and these are, in my humble opinion, quite hard to change. And I think that's also why it actually took us quite a few years before we were actually able to get like this investment or at least grow further than just bootstrapping as we as we have done for, I suppose, the last couple of uh, couple of years. Um, yeah, and as I said, we did like all kinds of small projects as an agency. I think this is for Amsterdam Art, uh, a nice, nice site there. Um, also a lot of like large projects. This is um, Ben.nl, telecom provider, a daughter company of T-Mobile Netherlands. And we used like these larger projects also to fund these small, small projects as well to fund the development of open social. We've actually had a couple of developers working on this uh, project and also the knowledge that we gained here, we put back into the to the open source part. I think more importantly, we also had Greenwire, which is the community we built for Greenpeace. At some point they had maybe well, well over, over 100,000 active users, I think, uh, spread across what they call regional offices. Uh, which are basically, um, uh, well, for example, um, uh, the, the the Nordic uh, Nordic uh, office is with Sweden, Norway, Denmark, etc. Which is a regional office, and they had fifteen or twenty or so of those across the world, which were live on on Greenwire. And last year we migrated most of these also to Open Social, which was for us a huge milestone, because Greenwire was actually the catalysator for us to move to Open Social. Because organizations wanted something similar to what we built for Greenpeace. Um, but this was a one-off thing we couldn't easily repeat. And that was because we, we built this one-off thing for Open Social, uh, for, for, sorry, for Greenpeace. And well, as you probably know how you do these projects or used to do projects, is that you can reuse some parts of it, but most of this is custom made according to the wishes of the client. And this was something we, well, couldn't couldn't easily repeat. Um, which brings us to the model we used to have, which is actually about services versus products. Um, what can you do for me, right? So it's uh, something that that the client asks, and you are providing that for them. Um, it's intangible, usually services, right? It's not scalable. You get paid per hour maybe per month, depending on how you do your, uh, if you do sprints, for example. And it's usually about strategy, design, development, etc. And more, most importantly, it's work you will do in the future. So it's not something you have on the shelf. And like, like most of us, we use the installation profiles uh, to do more, more of the work so you can actually reuse some of the work you've done in the past. But it's, well, most of the work, it's something you will have to do in the future. If we look at products, then this is quite different because on the, you have something off the shelf actually that you can let people buy. It's no longer, what can you do for me? It's about what can you give me? What do you have ready? What can you, uh, what can you give me? What can you provide me? 
um, it's tangible. It's digital, it's like even if it's digital, right? Like it's a product that you have, like open source is a product and you can just, well, you have it ready and you can sell it to your customers. With something like that we did for Greenpeace Greenwire, it was something that wasn't there yet. So it's not tangible. It's something that you have, will have in the future based on the, uh, well, the, the acceptance criteria and the discussion to have you have with the client. It's also scalable because, hey, you have it off the shelf. You can install it a hundred times. Doesn't really matter, right? Um, it's uh, w where you would be doing, well, if with, um, uh, with services, you will be able to utilize one hour for one project. Now you can utilize one hour for 100 projects or thousands. It doesn't really matter as long as you scale it in the right way, which we'll probably be talking a little bit more about this uh, later on during the slides. Um, and it's pay per, per piece, per usage, per month, um, if, if you're talking about, about SaaS. And again, like this is completely different to what to, to services. It's about the work you've done in the past. Like you invested in that in the past, and now you're selling it off the shelf. You have it ready, ready to be sold. With services, it's something you do in the future. So now that we did like a small brief of brief history about how we used to do and what like the differences with, with the model that we used to have and what we're doing now, let's take a bit bit of a deeper dive into what 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 open core is. Because there are some some parts here that are quite interesting, and it's quite an interesting business model because it, it's really a business model that 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 it, that it is. And as a quote from from Andrew Lampitt, he think I think he coined that, this term "open core" in in two thousand eight to better distinguish between uh, companies that that were saying, "Hey, we're, we're open source, we're selling open source," while they were actually selling. Um, commercially produced open source software. So there's always a bit of a definition um, impediment, which we'll also be talking about a little bit later. And of course, like a business model for the monetization of commercially produced open source software. The open core model primarily involves offering a core or feature limited version of a software product as free and open source software, while offering commercial versions or add-ons as proprietary software. So that's also somehow something what do we do with open social? We have the core, which is open source, which is freely available on um, on Drupal.org, which is feature limited. You know, we have for the commercially for commercial part, we have additional features that we're not open sourcing that that are proprietary. Um, so there's there's that 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 gap between hey, what's what is free and what is paid. So it's a business model for monetization of this open source software. If you look a little bit in the history as well, we see roughly three different big parts, which is COTS or commercial off the shelf software, uh, which is well, packaged software. Like this used to be in like between 1980s, roughly 2005 ish. You could buy a disc or download it later in the year as well. Like. Uh, more recently, you could, like with Photoshop, for example, with Adobe, you could download uh, uh, Photoshop or you could have a Windows on a disk and install it. Uh, then later on, you get like SaaS, which is the, the rise of software as a service. And the important to note is that this is like fully proprietary. So you have something like Salesforce, which is working in the cloud, uh, great. Uh, but it's completely proprietary. There's nothing open source about this. Um, it commercialized com completely, nothing given back to the community. Maybe in different projects, uh, but, but the project itself, or the product itself is completely proprietary. Also with Atlassian, a lot of people know that with, with Jira, for example. You know, this is not something you can install yourself um, free, but you have to pay for a license if you want to do it for the server, and otherwise you can use the cloud nowadays. And that's roughly between 2000 that this started to, well, to right about now, right? Um, and then more recently, you get like this open core model, which is a commercial open source software, as, as it's also called, where you have the uh, open source part as core of the product that you're selling to customers. And additionally to that, you have paid extensions or premium features or, well, uh, it could be like a, a, a trial that is available for the open source or for the for the free part. Um, 
and and on top of that you have like your your paid paid commercialized uh, part of the product i think well-known examples of this are G gitlab which is also a dutch company actually we're pretty proud about that in the netherlands or at least i think in the company we're pretty cool uh, cool to see like these these companies starting up as uh, and something that we also strive to be uh, in the end elastic is also a nice one mongodb uh, already quite some time ago roughly also started like 10 like a decade ago i would say um and what, what you see here is also that that and especially the major players are players in the infrastructure software for example gitlab elastic uh, HashiCorp, MongoDB, they're all like infrastructure or database software or search software. Let's see. So if we look at like the, like open open core, it's not binary, right? Like it's not open source versus proprietary. There's a whole thing layer in between. So you have different models of the open core part. If you look at skinny, you like you have like a skinny skinny. Uh, um, uh, a skinny option where you have well, roughly 90% open sourced and 10% proprietary or closed. And this closed part is usually light commercial plugins or extensions that go easy on top of the core. It's not really hard to do that. Uh, you're maybe using the same code base or well, maybe different repositories for your commercial part. Uh, but most of the fixes that you have to do for the commercial part, they're pushed to the core. So you get like a lot of lot of fixes, a lot of impact back into the open source part. Also because you know it's ninety percent open source. You see here that the uh, user control for the for the end user for the developer that is installing the open source variant is well maximum, right? Like, like you can't have a better model for the open source variant than this. You can also have a fin layer. You get to well pretty much 70% open source and 30% closed. It's more medium commercial. It, it extends or embed the core in, in, into your commercial part. You still get a lot of fixes that for the commercial parts that are also pushed to the core. And there are still a lot of work being done on the, on the open source core. Here you have a user control, which is medium. It's not. It's less because, like the commercial part, it's uh, it's more. So you don't have influence on that. I would say that open social at this point leans towards fin fin option. We still do a lot of things for the open source variant, but we also, in in the meantime, have been building on the the open source, of, like the commercialized crust, to be able to uh, to win clients over and to be able to distinguish between the two uh, two two parts. Lean is another one, like you have fifty percent closed, fifty percent open source, and here you're already looking at like heavy commercial part, right? They they really wrap around the open source core. Um, this usually also involves limited trial versions, um, and and here you see that most of the fixes for commercial parts, because it's quite far away from the core, they're not that often pushed to the upstream uh, there. You also see that the user control is low. It's not that open source anymore. And last but not least, you have like the FIC, which is maybe 10% open source, 90% closed. And uh, things like GitHub, GitHub uh, are our example staff of that. And they're like fundamentally based on like an open source software product project but they're almost completely closed or, or uh, proprietary. And there you, you see that they're usually materialized as SaaS servers. And fixes for commercial parts are, well, actually never never really pushed or maybe seldomly pushed to the core. Uh, and user control here is, well, limited, limited, uh, obviously. Another characteristic of, um, of open core companies is that usually, 90% or more of the work is actually done by the employees of the company. If you look at uh, Drupal, that's really an open source project because like anyone contributes to that. Like there's not really one company that does like 50% or 90% of the work. Obviously you have Acquia who pushes a lot of things, who dedicates a lot of time in that. 
but yeah, there are a lot of companies uh, also from Poland, for example, that are quite uh, quite big contributors to 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 Drupal, and obviously also your well your your regular open source uh, contributor, which is really what makes the project so awesome. Open core companies, it's a little bit different. Uh, the ninety percent of the commits or the work is done by the employees of that company. Um, for open social, at this point, I'd say it's probably around 95%. We've had times where we were more 90%, times where we were more towards 100% at some times. But usually we're, we're, we're doing the majority of the work. Um, and that's because this product, this open source product, is part of our uh, commercialized uh, solution, right? So we have a lot of manpower working on the core and the well, the, the crust around it. Um, we're benefiting a lot from the Drupal, Drupal community here, though, because they're finding like bugs, uh, fixing bugs, uh, adding patches, proposing new features, changes. Um, and this, like like we're working on GitHub, for example, like these contributors 48, this is not always visible uh, that the, all the work that has been done by all the other contributors on Drupal.org. Um, but yeah, like 90% of the work. And what's also important to say is that this is quite a controversial business model. People are saying it's not real open source, which is fair and fair enough, right? Um, it's not something like you're 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 not doing just pure open source software. You're selling something on top of that. So you shouldn't also market yourself as open source because that's pretty much lying. And that's also why the term, I think Andrew Lampitz in 2008 introduced that term open core to distinguish between companies that were saying, hey, we're open source and we're selling open source, which is in, in well, just not, not true, right? Um, but you should also not completely ignore it either. Like you have to advocate that you're doing some open source part because it's a really important part of what you're doing. And it's also part of like, to some extent, your business model. And why you are doing this, it's because either you, well, uh, uh, think it's important to some extent uh, to give away uh, things to the open source community, to have people work on it. It's really to advocate uh, to that part. Um, yeah, and, and what I said, right? People criticize companies who market themselves at open source, but really just sell closed source software. It's not fair. Um, Pure open source software business models. Like if you're looking at training, support services, company like Red Hat, for example, this is a really cool uh, cool example of uh, who does that. Just pure open source software. Horton works as well. Um, these aren't bad and can actually work. But what we're seeing is that these are just like it's a handful, right? It's just a couple of success stories. Where if we're looking at the open core companies, which have uh, the core open source and commercialized part around it, these are much more successful. If you have a business model more like ours, you can see that we have, uh, well, 90% of the users on the free open source core, and they're not paying, right? We have well, just made this screenshot uh, yesterday. I think we're now at like 1,500 users of open social. Like these are small fishing clubs. These are developers that want to, uh, that want to use uh, open social, nonprofits businesses selling open social Drupal Norway is using open social like this is really cool to see and this is also why we want to well use or put put it out there for people to use um so for open core it's really important that you know it's open source the core again like going a little bit going a little bit back in time to for for some history about that this is we have these eras of roughly 15 years apart where you have the free software movement in the beginning, which is really about liberalism, like it's liberating yourself from proprietary software, where they're also saying like proprietary software is evil. Um, Richard Stallman, he, he introduced that uh, instigators, and he said like, hey, you know, proprietary software is like malicious, evil, unjust, tainted, and it's really that, that the creator of the software is indirectly controlling or subjugating the user via the software. And the user just doesn't have any fundamental control. Fair enough, fair enough, that's true, because in that time, it's really about like these proprietary uh, uh, software was like Windows, et cetera, uh, Microsoft that, that we used to hate, right? 
economic impact was billions. In 15 years, the next period of 15 years, it's more like open source software. And the, the, the motivation for creating like this terminology, like this open source software, and the movement itself was really to build upon and continue to promote like the useful um, and essential components of the free software movement. Because there's a lot of things that are really important in that movement. Um, but but what they tried to change in that, that movement was to say, okay, you know, you have the liberalism, fine, you know, but let's go a little bit more pragmatic and say, uh, open source can be used for a lot of applications. Uh, let, let's put it more into the, like this utilitarian um, uh, manner. And there you also see the switch to in the relationship where they say proprietary software is not necessarily evil. Here, the economic impact, hundreds of billions, a lot of money going around. And, and here you see the, the, the next one, which is um, uh, commercialized open source software or indeed open core. Um, instigators here are like the critical mass of these successful companies. And these, there the com commercialization is the core emphasis. Like you're going to uh, sell as much as possible. And it's, it's also mostly targeted against uh, towards investors, founders, and innovators. Uh, we want to capture capture value from their open source software. Uh, and here, like, proprietary software is compl complementary. Um, like, why not go fully closed? It's a lot about doing something good for the world. Why, like, why are we working with Drupal? It's also because you want to be part of something bigger. You want to make something uh, better for the world. And, you know, open source is an equalizer. Anyone can participate. You can reduce uh the the duplication of effort you can see that people are solving bugs that we haven't encountered yet which is awesome um you see that development tar talent wants to work in the open so having that open part is really important for attracting good talent and a lot of the things that we're doing are also quite interesting we see with open social for example that we can help people uh, talk to each other about this and help them build their own solutions and companies and like it's in our DNA, it's probably also in your DNA. Uh, so, so some of the fundamentals that we've learned along the way, uh, building building the company, um, let's take a quick look at those. It's, I think, I think a really important thing is setting the right mindset. For us, because we moved from an agency to a product, it's like turning an oil tanker around. It takes a lot of time um, and it takes, takes a lot of effort to change your mindset as well. So it means that you should not focus on selling like hosting services or consultancy, one of the things doing large enterprise projects. It's really, you're selling a product, you're selling an off the shelf product. You need to focus on that. Everything costs money. So also spending your time on things that aren't important is very dangerous. So you need to be very careful where you spend your money and, and time. You can only spend it once same as that you would have done with when you were an agency um, you can only do bill a bill one hour right you can only spend one hour to something that you choose um, your company goals also change quite a bit they're quite different from working as an agency and services because there you want to maximize your profit profit you want to maximize your revenue um, and you want to make sure your percentage of billable hours is as high as it can be um, with the SaaS product, it's more about maximizing your recurring revenue. So it's a whole different ball game, right? So you want to make sure that um, those hours, those billable hours, not that important anymore. You want to really have a stable recurring revenue to sustain your business and preferably also grow from that. Your business model, where what, what we were saying, right, uh, also changes from non recurring work. Uh, you're doing something that you can do for the client, the client comes to the wish, you're gonna see if you can help them. Um, mostly non-recurring work, you're selling hours, making them as billable as, as possible. And the payment is upfront or within a few months. Where now your recurring revenue, you're doing going for that. Um, you want to have a stable revenue stream and you wanna make sure that you can um, uh, sell your product. And here the payment is after. So it's a recurring revenue. You get a payment in small portions each month or in each year. 
So now you have like a, you go from a project where you get like 50,000, for example, get it in uh, three months, you get three different uh, uh, 10K, 20K, 20K, you're done, to a product where you get, well, you know, 1K per month for 36 months, which is a huge gap. So this is something that you need to solve and you need, also need to predict beforehand. You need to work on this, think about this, get enough money to be able to sustain you, uh, your development in the for the coming months. If we're looking at marketing and sales, you want to go from advertising your services and agency, where yeah, you're just doing your services that you're advertising. You have maybe a small sales team, if you have any, um, and it's fairly cheap, right? Um, the marketing and sales part to selling your product, which is quite expensive because if you look at customer acquisition cost, is probably around the one year SaaS fee, which can be, well, let's say uh, 12K maybe or 10K. So this is quite expensive. Um, also, if you look at, for example, what you would do with um, with with with, with, um, uh, with the money, you work like 10,000 hours on a project over four months, you get paid 25K per month, you have to pay 20K in salary, put some other cost, and you keep some profit, well, which is fine. You can go for a long run, Great, but now if you go in a different with SaaS, you work thousand hours on the product over four months. You have four clients signing for thousand a month. So the first month you get four thousand euros, and you need well at least sixteen thousand, for example, to pay salaries. So there's this huge gap where you would have forty. Well, let's say for four months we would one hundred k versus well four sixteen k in over over four months. So it costs a lot of money to to invest in, in building a product. And that's also where you get like this term valley of death, where you go into your, your money goes down a lot, and then you try to uh, go break even and grow outside of this valley of death. But you know, you have to spend your money for building the project for, for uh, uh, office host, hosting costs, etc. Marketing staff, ads, uh, sales staff, it's a completely different goal ball game. So this is important too, and that's also one of the lessons we learned is that we've been bootstrapping for a long time uh, with open social. And now we're at the point where we, well, we're going, growing out of this valley of death, getting investment indeed, um, and now focusing on the on the next part where we want to grow, uh, grow open social. One of the very important things that we, that, that you need to do is find your product market fit. And your product market fit consists of market size, the relevance, the budget, and the competition, roughly speaking. Um, you have to choose an initial market, which is large enough, large enough to sustain growth in, well, let's say next three to five years, and where you could have global potential, or at least enough potential to grow into a stable, stable revenue stream. Relevance is important, like, do you provide like an essential component to a crucial business process? If you don't, like why would people buy it? And why would people pay money for you each month? Um, and why would they say, keep, keep doing that for a couple of years, for example? And obviously budget, like do customers have the budget and are they willing to pay for your solution? And last but not least, competition, like who is your competition? Can you replace solutions that and current way of working, which could be Google spreadsheets or PowerPoint presentations, like, can you replace that? Can you win from the competition? Um, for the product market fit, for example, we're also redoing that uh, right now with Open Social, specifying again, like, hey, what, what's, where do we fit uh, the best? Open source is super important. Like you have an open core, which is like already in a name, right? It's part open source. And although you can have like different commercial crust thickness, if, if you can put it like that. It's also very important that this open source part is very usable and you give enough freedom like to the end user to install it themselves, play around with it, it change it a little bit. Big, going with super thick crust, it's yeah, I think it's a bad idea. Um, and it's also very important for the community to not feel that like you're keeping essential functionality back. So for example, with open social, we're always balancing the act between, hey, should this be proprietary or not? And we usually choose for essential functionality, 
to definitely go back to, into the open source uh, variant, into the core product. Um, yeah, and, and you know, for most successful open core companies, like the, your, their customers are also um, only a small percentage of their overall users. Like most of your users are uh, open source, uh, open source users. And you know you can use it for your marketing purposes as well. Uh, for government, for example, in the Netherlands, it's really important to have like open source basis of the product, which in this case it's just nice marketing tool. And and building the cross, like in, in to what extent should you should you go right? What's like the what what's like on top of your open source product? What do you need to do in order for actually getting customers to pay for your product? Um, Martin Bikos, he was, I think, once the CEO of MySQL. Um, they, he, had a, he had a quote at some point where he said something like, you need to come to terms with the idea that some people will spend any amount of time to save money, which is well, you, like your open source part. But other people, which is your business model, will spend money to save time. Like it is that philosoph philosophical difference between people that make the business model. So what what your your commercialization part is is basically what is the part that that people are willing to pay for to save time, right? Um, so you need to think about like why would someone pay for my software? What's saving them time? for example, not having to build it themselves, or what is like this killer feature that is on top of your open source part that could be uh, well like the five five percent ten percent of your customers or users of the product that want to pay for that specific part. Um, and, and you know, how thick should your cross be? It's, it's always a matter of like balancing. Um, as, as I said, we're, we're always debating inside open source, like what should be, um, what should be free, what should be, what should be proprietary. For example, we have a bunch of different extensions that we have on top of open social. Some are op also, also open source, for example, I think, uh, ideation uh, or, or courses that part of that is open source um, or even if different parts of like these extensions are open source. And if you look at how, how it looks like at open social, we have like the core product at the center of all our customer sites. Then we have different tiers where customers can pay like and get additional um, additional features. And it grows really with the client ambition. We have some proprietary systems which we can use to update, maintain, upsell client sites and give them, for example, additional extensions or bring them to new tiers. So it's really a, this difference the, that that uh, that we give to our clients that is the incentive for them to to buy open social and not use the open source variant. So really, it's about thinking like, hey, how thick is your crust for us? As I said, like we're probably between skinny and thin, more leaning towards thin. I don't think we'll ever go to lean because it's like too much proprietary. And I think it's always important to have also really big connection with, uh, with the open source community. One super important thing, scaling. If you wanna scale, and this is more about SaaS probably than, than, than open core, open source, then you need to think about scale. And this is your organization that needs to scale. So this is about standardization, automation. It's not just for development, although it's usually easy for development, uh, development because well, it sounds normal to do automation. It's kind of like in your day job, but it's not always so for sales. Like if we're do, if for example, we're do, talking about reducing maintenance, you know, there are a couple of things. You want to standardize your sites, your extensions. Yeah, I want to have some flexibility, but you don't want to go too far off. Like, I think that's also one of the things that, that we've learned in Open Social, uh, where we made the most mistakes uh, 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 before, is that, you know, we, we went too far away from the open source core with some of our enterprise sites. And it's now really hard to update them. It takes a lot of hours to do that. And it's very costly. Uh, we also had clients bootstrap, or sorry, clients driving our roadmap, and we were building extensions that don't necessarily do a lot, or they're very custom. Also, a bad idea. You know, it didn't really help to close the gap uh, with competition, competition, and we're spending too much time on these. Um, 
and for sales, and that's 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 really important. You know, we we used to have what's called like founder-led sales. So we had like our founder uh, Taco Patsa who did all the sales, and if he wasn't there, no one was doing sales. And this, well, obviously doesn't scale, right? Um, so you need to standardize processes. You need to have no well, just processes like Drybook uh, to to repeat and and improve sales constantly because. SaaS is about selling, simply. We learned a lot from Winning by Design, which is like a super interesting site to look at. Uh, it's a company, Winning by Design, that that really has a lot of like information on, on how and a lot of material on how you can scale your sales organization, your marketing organization. Really uh, helpful to probably take a look at that. Um, and, and for SaaS, you know, MRR, it's super important. I think that's one of the things that we didn't always do right. Like we've always had MRR in the back, uh, a monthly recurring revenue in the back of our minds. But we, especially when we were still bootstrapping, we used like a lot of like this one-off revenue and we didn't really fight enough for recurring revenue. So we, we would get like a nice amount of money, but that didn't really contribute to like our MRR goals. So, you know, we would have some money that we could invest, but nothing to really grow grow our company for that. So really fight for this current revenue. And, and you, you can use this one-off revenue obviously to bootstrap. I think this is maybe the most important thing I can I can talk about. And you can post in the chat to where you think Waldo is. I'm not sure if anyone knows these things. Where's Waldo? The, just take a look at this uh, this screen and uh, and, and uh, try to figure out where he is. Show you where he is later in the slides. Um, but what we're talking about here is like focus. Like don't do all the things. Prioritize. Focus on what is important. If you go with all like the custom development, what customers want, they always want something different. They always want something that's unique for them. It doesn't match your roadmap, and it's just a distraction. And you need to think about like, hey, in, in what stage of the company are you? Like, are you closing the gap with competition? Are you building something to increase MRR? Focus on what's important for your company. You can spend your hours just like with an agency only once, right? Only on one task. So it's really important to consider how you do this. So more recently, we used the RISE model from, I think it's Intercom, where we, well, use this model to prioritize our roadmap. Can recommend uh, looking at this one. And, and last but not least, really important asset, your team. You know, you, you need to be transparent. You need to be take them on each step of the way if you're going from an agency to a product. But your team is like your most important asset if you're building a company, in any case. If it's an agency, if it's an open core SaaS uh, company, like it's your really most important asset. Also, we're looking like at the time now, so I'm right on time, I think. Just a shameless plug, like we have some careers. So if you want to take, uh, you know, go work with Open Social, just take a look at uh, our, our site uh, for some of our career options. There's Waldo. Focus on one thing, focus on what's important. All right, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, super happy that I could be here to, uh, to, to to talk a little bit about open social and our company and op open core in, in general. Uh, hope to be joining you in Poland in real life next year. Ah, uh, let's see if there's any question. Ah, Machi, do you reject requests from paying customers if they have two custom requirements? Yeah, so this is like the really hard thing that we learned. Yes, we do reject requests. So we do a couple of things there. We either say, hey, we don't want to do this. Uh, we can bring you to 80% with the extensions or the, the, the product that we have already. Um, and usually customers accept that. Um, and sometimes, you know, like it's also about like taking opportunity. If they have a, well, a relatively in interesting uh, proposition to make, like we can go ahead with that and just take the money. Uh, but usually it's um, it, it's it's a no if it doesn't match uh, with um, with uh, with uh, the roadmap goals that we have, for example. Cool. Now I don't think there is any more questions. If you have any other questions, you can always reach me on 
on the via mail or get me on Twitter, for example, or I'll be here in the chat for uh, today and tomorrow. So uh, um, you can always uh, contact me about uh, some of these things and uh, we can see if we can talk about that. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, happy, uh, happy, uh, happy to be here and I hope to see you uh, in real life uh, next year at uh, DrupalCamp Poland. Stay safe.